five minutes away from nine. numbers are difficult to come by, but the new report says there have been between 26 and 44 U.S. strikes, most of them since the start of the uprising in Yemen last year. Those strikes have killed up to 516 people, and between 54 and 104 of those were civilians. Following an airstrike in southern Yemen in December 2009, a Yemeni parliamentary report said 44 civilians were killed, along with 14 fighters. But despite physical evidence that a U.S. missile was involved, backed up by leaked diplomatic cables, Washington's never acknowledged operations in Yemen. It is Eye on the World. Terrorism is our topic of discussion with Paul Buchanan, principal and co-founder of 36-parallel.com. Paul, welcome back to the show. Good morning. And uh, today, in fact, talking about more like the evolution of terrorism, how terrorism has changed over the years. Um, where to start with this one? Well, I think that, you know, given the time constraints we have, uh, it's worth pondering this evolution in terms of, A, where the central front is and the so-called war on terrorism, and B, uh, how the tactics of terrorists have changed over the last decade. And so let me start with the, uh, the front. Contrary to popular opinion and contrary to what we're seeing on our TV screens uh, as of late, the central front in the war between uh, uh, Islamic, is, Islamist jihadis and uh, the rest of the world, the West in particular, is not Central Asia. It's not in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has turned into a civil war. The Taliban are an indigenous force that use irregular tactics to remove the occupiers from their midst. And most of the al-Qaeda operatives that used to use Afghanistan as a safe haven, they're either dead or gone. Hmm. Pakistan has stepped up the fight against the al-Qaeda elements that exist in uh, Waziristan, the Northwest Territories, uh, in order to broker a deal with their Taliban, who also are indigenous forces. So where do the jihadis go? Well, as it turns out, jihadis are attracted to failed states. They're attracted to failed states for two reasons. First of all, it gives them cover, they can operate, they can train, they can use their, do their logistical preparations uh, in the absence of an effective law enforcement capability. And B, if the uh, local authority is very weak, uh, they can actually challenge it for supremacy within a given geographic area. Well, what part of the world has a number of failed states uh, and uh, would offer them such an opportunity to relocate away from Central Asia now that the crunch is on uh, in that part of the world? Well, the answer is Saharan and Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. And so the Central Front and the war on terrorism is definitely moving to Africa. In fact, many argue that it has already moved to Africa. And what's important there is we're not talking about failed states such as Yemen, Somalia, uh, now the two Sudans, but we're talking Niger, Mali, and most importantly, Nigeria, Kenya, and uh, Tanzania, Nigeria in particular. So uh, contrary to uh, uh, many beliefs that the war on terrorism is winding down because essentially al-Qaeda has been defeated uh, in the Arabian Peninsula and in Central Asia, it is now moving to a new evolution. So does that change um, the, uh, the the look of terrorism? Does that change the way um, they conduct their terrorist activities? Uh, yes, it does. And uh, that brings up the second point, which is the change in tactics. And uh, this is not uh, confined to jihadis. Uh, Right-wing extremists have adopted these tactics, which is essentially to decentralize operations become self-radicalized using the internet and reading extremist literature on the internet and engaging in what are known as lone wolf or small group tactics. And a very classic case in point is the Norwegian uh, terrorist or the Norwegian right wing Anders Breivik, mm. who killed 77 people, prepared for it on his own. He was known to the authorities because of his pension funds, but they thought he was just a harmless nutter. It turns out he was not. And the reason that extremists of all stripes have gone to these lone wolf, decentralized, self-radicalized uh, tactics 
is that the multinational anti-terrorist effort over the last 10 years has been very effective in disrupting al-Qaeda's networks, any terrorist network that involves significant numbers of people in preparation for large-scale events. Quite frankly, we will probably not see an event of the magnitude of 9-11, or for that matter, an event of the magnitude of the embassy bombings in sub-Saharan Africa uh, of a decade ago, but what we may see is uh, equally nasty activities on the part of individuals or small groups, for example, perhaps targeting malls, targeting uh, bus stops, train stops, and the like, uh, using improvised explosives, homemade materials in order to uh, get a lot of bang for their buck. I use that pun. So uh, what we've seen is two things, a shift in the front, a shift in the tactics, and I guess the warning here is that once the shift occurs and moves to lone wolf small group activities that are self-radicalized and not part of a larger organization, they're very difficult to detect in advance which means that uh, their particular activities, uh, and particularly their attacks, are very difficult to prevent, and uh, they're worldwide. And that raises the question, of course, of whether or not we here in New Zealand are immune to the phenomena, and I would argue that we are not. Um, well, that brings up um, you know, uh, the, the, the latest episode of terrorism um, in Kabul, although it depends on what side of the fence you're on, whether or not you consider that to be terrorism or just, in fact, just civil war. Um, but the Taliban there and the bombings in Kabul, um, do they fit into this new style that you're talking about? No, they do not. This is actually very classic. The, uh, the attacks that we've just seen in the past 48 hours in Kabul are the launching of the Taliban spring offensive. But most importantly... They're a symbolic reminder to the West and to the ISAF forces, the coalition in Afghanistan, that long after the Westerners have left Afghanistan, the Taliban will remain. And the Taliban are in the process now of quietly trying to negotiate a place for themselves in a post-ISAF Afghanistan. And the guy who's got to be really worried about this is Karzai, because Karzai uh, basically is propped up by ISAF. He's turned on them in order to try to win popular support in the wake of some of the atrocities that have been committed in recent years by uh, Western troops. But quite frankly, I think that he better be uh, padding his retirement fund, and we do know that he pads his retirement fund, because he's going to be living in exile after 2014. There's mm. no doubt about that. Mm. And so the Taliban are, again, they're an indigenous force, so they play rough. But against a superior conventional military, you have to play rough. You have to go to irregular tactics. And what I should note in these attacks is that they did not kill off a lot of civilians. These were not terrorist attacks. These were attacks on hardened structures, embassies, government buildings, ISAF headquarters itself, inside the blast barriers of the so-called protected zones in Kabul, hmm. which speaks to a porous intelligence network at best, uh, failures of a magnitude that are really quite striking at this stage of the game. Uh, but all of this is symbolic. It's designed to simply stake the claim that they are there for good long after the Westerners leave, and Karzai and his supporters are going to have to deal with them. This is a far cry removed hmm. from lone wolf jihadi terrorism or even the right-wing terrorism that we've seen in the United States in the form of Timothy McVeigh, Ted Kaczynski, and now, of course, this Norwegian uh, uh, murderer. So, so picking up on your point, though, um, about New Zealand back here, and you said that we weren't um, immune from uh, these, these lone wolf type uh, attacks. Do you, do you actually believe that? Uh, well, I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. Now, the interesting thing, just to tie it into Afghanistan, is that uh, you realize, of course, that the New Zealand embassy was targeted by the Taliban. Yeah. And that's important to realize because that means that we are on the Taliban's radar scope. Hmm. And the Taliban have friends in many different places. But more importantly, that means that we're at war with Muslims. And New Zealand doesn't have a history of conflict with the Muslim world. It is possible, given the devolution of tactics to lone wolf, self-radicalized activities, 
that an individual in New Zealand uh, perusing the internet, getting angrier and angrier and angrier at the treatment of Muslims abroad at the hands of New Zealanders, because let's be frank, when the SAS was killing terrorists in Afghanistan, they were killing Muslims. And so now that we've gone down to the lone wolf decentralized scenario uh, with self-radicalization occurring because of exposure to the Internet, then it is eminently possible that there could be at least one individual in New Zealand today whose levels of frustration, levels of anger are rising to the point that, that they would start to contemplate uh, emulating lone wolves in other parts of the world. And uh, my impression is that uh, the New Zealand security services, uh, the police, as well as the SIS, uh, are aware of this possibility and, in fact, have moved proactively to get in front of any possible radicalization. And by that, what I mean is there's some reason to believe that both the police and the SIS have infiltrated at least a couple of mosques uh, based on reports that within those mosques are people who uh, harbor extremists and have talked about acting upon them. Wow, goodness me. Well, let's hope that um, it doesn't come to, uh, to, to a, a bad end here in New Zealand. But, uh, Paul, thanks very much for your time today on this one. Um, and uh, people can find this as a video once more up at livenews.co.nz and more at 36-parallel.com.